My name is Monk Rowe for the Phileas Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased to have Alicia Olatuja for us uh, for the Phileas Jazz Archive. Welcome to Hamilton. Thank you for having me. And uh, congratulations <laughs> on your career so far. Oh, thank you. I have a great team of people, and one of the members of my team is right there, Miles Weinstein, and I have a great band, and we all work together, and we're like a team, and we just push each other forward. You anticipated a question. Um, Oops. But first, I just want to say See? you're one of the few people I've met who went from a Mozart opera to <laughs> Dr. Lonnie Smith. <laughs> That's a, does it yeah. seem like a leap or not? Uh, well, I think I was exposed to soul music before I was doing Mozart. So in my brain, it mm -hmm. wasn't a leap because all the music is always playing. But I would see how on a resume that might look a little interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the drama involved in being in an opera inform you on stage now? Hmm. Well, I mean, I feel like performers and singers in general do have an element of drama just built into their DNA. Um, I mean, for us to be communicators, we are like the griots of this generation. We're the storytellers. We're the ones who take you on a journey. And if you've ever worked with you know, a group of five-year-old children and try to tell them a story, you just take those exact same skills and, you know, they're not thinking about bills and Facebook. So imagine how much more distracted like the average adult audience is. So you just have to take that same energy and tell the same story and it requires you to be animated and requires you to believe in what you're saying and speak with courage and conviction. And I think that goes for if you're just standing in front of a room full of people talking like now, or singing on stage. It's all about communication, I think. Not so much the drama, but communicating. I shared something with you that we both did, and that is being a teaching artist. Uh -huh. Is that amazing work? I love it. Well, yeah. I'm, I've, I've been told that teaching is in my blood. My mother is a teacher. My grandmother was a, was a teacher, an educator, a professor, but also a nurse. And she was a head nurse to teach other nurses. And education is just really important. To, to, it was important to me, it changed my life. Um, and I just, I really love watching that moment when things click and even helping someone through when you're hitting that wall and it's just like, oh. Uh, and we all experience that every day with something, especially if we're brave enough to try to get better at something. So I like being a part of that. Did you have a sort of an aha moment in, you know, as a youth with a recording or something in church? Hmm. Uh, more oh no than aha, but <laughs> I will say, I think aha moments come when you realize that someone believes in you. I think that was my aha moment. And you kind of just put together a bunch of different aha moments until you actually say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. So I say my first aha moment was when I was in kindergarten <laughs> and I was, they used to play the Whitney Houston Star Spangled Banner over the intercom. And I would stand up and we'd just be like so proud and we could sing along if we wanted to and I sang along real strong and my teacher Mrs. Marge I still remember her I can't find her but I've been looking Mrs. Marge you're out there well <laughs> spell it maybe we'll help miss you. I don't know how to spell it I was in fifth oh. I was five I don't know how to spell. <laughs> but her name is Mrs. Marge and she pulled me aside and she was like Alicia I'm gonna tell you something she's like you're not gonna know what this means right now but one day you're gonna understand and I was like, what's that, Ms. Marge? I thought I was in trouble. She said, one day you're going to be a great singer, but remember, do not get the big head. And I was like, my head is going to get, like I thought my, I thought she meant like hydrocephaly, like I was gonna, <laughs> but she's like, I know you don't understand right now, but you will. And in a sense, it was like, that was the first person who told me basically they hear something. They hear something in my voice. They hear something that has potential for something. And it's not so much always that you realize it about yourself because sometimes that takes, that's to, that to me is almost like another journey, self-acceptance um, as an artist and what you hear. But to actually be told this is something that is, is a great possibility for your life at such a young age, you know, it put that little light bulb on and say, oh, okay, maybe, maybe she knows something I don't know which obviously she did. That's terrific. Have you developed a, sort of an inner alarm when something comes, an opportunity in your career, and you feel like tempted to do it? 
and then say, wait a minute, let me think about this. Oh man, see, I'm not good at that. That's why I have to have a team to help me. Cause I'm always like, this, my philosophy, even when I was in school, when I was singing and performing is to say yes to everything. I really think you should say yes to as much as you possibly can because there's so many opportunities that you want that someone's gonna say no to. Someone else is gonna be the gatekeeper of that opportunity. So if you can do something, just do it. If you, even if you don't know if you could do it, do it. I've had people say, you know, I don't, oh, I, I, would, I would have done this gig, but I don't do that type of music. I'm like, you should have said yes and then learned it really quickly and then did the gig. You know, I think you have to just say yes. You have to do as much yes, yes, yes as you possibly can until you really cannot say yes, until you have a conflict, until you feel like, you know what, I don't think that this is going to be, this is a part of what my mission is. I don't think this is actually the direction in which I want to go. But ultimately, I'm, I'm more of a just say yes to everything unless you feel like it's going to take away from another yes. If you try to do everything, do you risk not having an identity in the nope. music business? That's a good question. That's such a good question. And it was some, it's something that I've, I have had to answer and ask and question other people about since I was a freshman in college. And it's been very interesting. I spoke with like, like this really amazing opera, you know, diva extraordinaire. And I said to her, you know, can I take classical technique and just learn how to work my instrument and then like sing any genre I want? And she looked at me <laughs> up and down. And she was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she like flung her scarf and like walked out the room all dramatic. And I was like, really? And then I spoke with the music history professor, Dr. Buds, he's actually quite brilliant. And I said to him, you know, I'm, I love all different types of music and I feel like I'm being informed by all different types of genres. Do I have to pick one and shut the door on all these other ones? It makes me feel like I'm at a buffet and I'm just determined to eat the pasta. And he said to me, he's like, you know what? Just try to get good at one thing and then build on that. Just, but he said, you can't be bad at everything or mediocre at a bunch of things. He said, you know, really figure out what it requires to be excellent at something and then use that same method to be excellent at more and more things. He's like, and then, you know what, you know, whatever. People, people are way more, you know, forgiving and open and, and to an artist who is already shown that they are willing to be dedicated to an art form and, and really pour themselves into it and then transfer over to other other genres. Do you think it's harder to rise up in the hierarchy in the opera world or in the jazz world? You know, it depends. It just depends on your opportunities. It depends on your dedication. It depends on your voice. I don't mean like how good or bad you are. I mean like a soprano's chances are not as easy as a bass baritone, for instance. Just getting into a conservatory, most of the scholarships go to the men because there's less of them. So I was told like for every um, four sopranos, they hear one mezzo. For every, one met for every four mezzos, it's, a, it's one tenor. For every four tenors, it's one bass. And so, you know, there were guys who had not spent as much time as the soprano had working on this and working on that, but she didn't get the scholarship. You know, he got the scholarship and he was like, I don't know, I think I want to do singing or maybe football. <laughs> like he wasn't even really, you know, serious about what he was doing, but he had a beautiful voice, but they needed these male singers so badly that, you know, the, there were so many sopranos that were rejected and therefore it will impact their chances at success. But I think, you know, it all depends on where you go after that, what you do with the, the opportunities that you have. I've seen people take an opportunity that people would laugh at and turn that thing into gold. And I've seen people take these platinum opportunities and just squander, you know? So I think it depends on the individual. It depends on the opportunities and then what you do with those opportunities. And I think that applies for both classical and jazz. And then it's about what do you consider success to be? When I was in college and all us guys who wanted to, we wanted to make it. Mm -hmm. in the music business. And I don't even think we really knew well, what was that <laughs> We, we want to make it. Mm -hmm. does, does that have a, 
Is oh yeah, it? that's like making it. Oh, that's such a good one. That's such a, these, these are really good questions, by the way. I'm enjoying these questions. Well, maybe we should cancel your concert <laughs> and just keep talking. Do I still get the check at the end, though? <laughs> okay. <laughs> just want to know. That's, that's good okay. business. Miles, <laughs> work on that. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting. Making it means many different things to many different people. I think you have to figure out what making it means to you and not what making looks like to somebody else or what somebody tells you making it means. For some people, it's just being debt free. You're already, what, how much the percentage of America is in debt, first of all? So, I mean, like, if you could just be debt free, you are up in the higher percentage, upper echelon of like American and America's and, and their finances. So, maybe that's somebody's idea of making it. Somebody else's idea of making it, dear friend of mine, was that she said, I want to be a professional singer, but I also want to be married and have kids. Like, I don't want to have to choose. And so she did that. And there was a season that was really, really tricky for her, but she made it work. She's, I don't know, a superwoman, but she, that is her idea of success. Other people is to travel around the world, have no strings attached anywhere, to be able to pick up and go whenever I want and not have to answer to anybody and not have to worry about where I'm gonna live and not have to not, I, I know I can go to Spain and find an apartment and if I get tired of that, like that's their idea. Not everybody wants to be Beyonce. Not everybody even should be. Oh my God. You know, so there's many different ideas of success. And I, I think the, the, the sad part is that a lot of times people feel pressure to become as successful as other people say they should be. And success is so many different things. There are people that I never knew of until I got into the world of jazz. Never heard their name. I didn't even know they existed. And then, but that doesn't mean that they weren't successful until I discovered who they were. It's ridiculous. They were already, they were Grammy Award winners. They had houses in foreign countries and houses in America. They, they could go anywhere they want. They only have to do a few performances a year and they're loaded. And I had no idea who they were. Does that mean they're not successful because they're not a worldwide household name like Michael Jackson? No. Nah. And look what happened to him. Yeah. Okay. I want to play Name That uh -oh. Alicia Toon. Oh, who plays this? Me it's or right the... right there. Oh, God. Are you, are you doing this to me? <laughs> These are the students. They should be sight reading. <laughs> well, this thing has been stuck in my head. And this looks like Truth in Blue, yes, though. Yes, it is. Okay. okay. So I, I wanted to... You, you passed the audition. Oh, God. I wanted to ask you about that note. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 da. Like that half step there? Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> My ears were expecting an F sharp, I guess. Do you remember? Well, there's that? more to that. That's actually the piece of another story. Okay. In the very beginning, it has the melody. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. I don't know what key I'm in anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. oh. So that's the thing that happens in the beginning. And then comes that line. Yes. Doom, 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 doom. So that's the whole arc. And the arc tells the story. So those, in the very beginning, there's those three lines, right? And what happened for me is that I kept hearing those three lines playing in my head over and over and over again, like for months. It was crazy. And I felt like they were trying, the notes had a story, but I had to try to figure it out or else I couldn't write the rest of the song. So then when I sat down with the melody and I thought, oh my goodness, it was like all of a sudden it made sense to me. The melody starts the same, but the ending has slight variations. And the first line basically, me it, it represented when you're starting a relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's romantic. It can be, but it can be friendship. At the time it was friendship for me. Um, and you start it and it doesn't quite work out the way you want it to. And, but it's not bad. It just didn't, you know, didn't, there was no, something went. And then you try it again and then it really goes left on you. And that's when you maybe have the bad breakup. And then you have the third time you try it again. And then it goes, oh, oh, oh. And what you have is like a moment of acceptance. 
where it resolves. And then the line doom, 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 is just the, whatever the next phase in life is, but it keeps playing over and over again until you find the solution that you have to accept. And so the song is called Truth and Blue because you hear about white lies and you hear about you know bad lies. There's all these different shades of what a lie is, but ultimately a lie is a lie. And I believe the same thing applies to truth. We try to come up with all these different versions of truth. Or maybe, I don't know, I mean, it could have worked out, but maybe it was just, oh, no, I just need, you know, we make all these excuses because we don't want to accept the truth about something because the truth is just, we cannot feel resolution in that. We don't, we're not satisfied with it. But the thing is, until you accept the truth about something, you will continue to repeat it over and over again, regardless if that truth is something that you want to accept or not. You will continue to experience it and you'll never feel rest. And so that's why that note does that. And that's why the song ends with that as well. Because at the end of the song, we don't know if I've gotten it yet. So that's what that is. That seems a bit brainy, yeah, but <laughs> I mean like that. Not all the songs are like that, that but. Yeah, uh, that's a great, great yeah. back, a back story to that. Anyway, it's, and it's, I love the way the song just starts out with just you. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like, uh, a little bit of something to listen to to capture your attention. Mm. At least that's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. what's, what's, you know, what's going to come next? And as opposed to everybody starting together. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, <laughs> one. <laughs> Bow! Yeah. Do you, um, I have to take a few questions here, but I just wonder, do you ever, in collaborating with your, your bandmates, mm -hmm. uh, have to say, what is that chord? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know you're trying something over there, mm -hmm. but maybe not that. Well, usually I, I, if we're arranging together, I like to give my band a lot of freedom. I actually don't like to control, even if I feel uncomfortable a little bit, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's okay as an artist to feel uncomfortable and to figure out how to make this thing work. I mean, if they go really strong left and I'm like, that, that is horrible, but they don't usually do that. They are very, very musical people and very, very um, musical musicians so usually they're going to make a choice and it makes some sort of sense but if it, if there are times I've had to like wrangle the names I'm like just for the sake of time I'm like look we got a uh, half an hour to arrange this song we're running out of time I gotta pay up at the desk can we just figure out just do a pedal just do a pedal and do whatever chord you want to do on top of the pedal like I've had to do that yeah. but I don't like to rein in their creativity because I feel like I'm I still want to learn mm -hmm. I still want to grow and this is even though, yes, it's my face and my name on the poster, this, for me, it never feels like the Alicia Latuja show. Mm -hmm. It feels like this is a chance for all of us to listen to each other and try to push it a little bit. And sometimes I do feel uncomfortable. I have to really, I take a minute and try to decide, do I really want to change that or not? Do I really need to change it? Or should I just let it sit for a while and see what happens? Yeah, because it might not be this played the same the next time it comes around anyway. Right, um. right. There are, I'm way more specific with vocals. Like if, if I have background, I usually have like incredible additional vocalists with me and I have great vo voices in the band. But usually with them, that's when I get like really like, because there's something specific that they have to communicate mm -hmm. and they have to function as instruments, not as necessarily as a human, they have to almost function as a string instrument. Yeah. So if they want to do like something really funky, I'm like, <laughs> save that for that other song. Not, not there, please. Oh, yeah. Do we have a <coughs> question from the audience? Someone want to ask? <laughs> yes. Hey, how are you doing? Um, I'm just curious, do you ever take, uh, do you ever look at like contemporary artists and like incorporate bits into your own style from even household names like Beyonce, like you mentioned? I don't know. Well, I mean, it's great that you mentioned that because the next pr album that I just recorded is actually called um, Intuition Songs from the Minds of Women. And it's celebrating and championing women composers. And I use, they collected a bunch of different songs from women composers of all the genres and backgrounds. And, you know, from Joni Mitchell to Imogene Heap to Sade to my student, like, as well as my own songs as well. Um, but I think you know, hearing the through line of the experience, the human experience is what I'm really going after. I'm really trying to capture that because music is all about unifying us above our race and religion and, and political point of views. And I think 
that can't be boxed in a genre and you can't say I, I refuse to be influenced by this person because you know they whatever reason so I'm, I'm influenced by a lot of different musicians and artists and I'm gonna do one of those tunes tonight so hopefully you'll recognize it but anyway it's a different arrangement but it's pretty cool yeah I was just listening to your version of uh, somewhere over the rainbow ah yes I, where do you come up with that well I actually Half of it, I had, um, a friend of mine, Christian Sands, he had arranged that for his trio. And it was just the same uh, eight bars that were looping. And I was like, oh, how lovely. But it was, it was just the, the somewhere over the rainbow, da 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 It was not the someday I'll wish upon a star, which to me is like, so then we sat down. And I said, you know, I really want to do that part of the song, but we need to build to this. Like, I can't just do nothing for, you know, eight bars. And then I really wanted to stretch the line and stretch the text. And um, yeah, we just kind of made it flow. And yeah, I really nice. like it. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough sing, I like it. A tough sing, I like that <laughs> Yes? So I think um, music these days has become a lot more electronic and processed. And um, there are a lot of artists who are staying true to their sound and staying raw with acoustic instruments and, and voices without a lot of you know, digital manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think music is headed in that regard? Do you think that there's going to be like a revival of, you know, the, the classic band sound? Or what do you think? Well, I think the world of music is big and I think there's room for all of it. I don't think it's really the musicians or the artists that are making it marginalized. I think it's the music industry that's telling people what they want to hear. And I think also music industry isn't about music, not pop music you know, and not a lot of, just music industry in general, most industries and businesses are just about money anyway. Yeah. So it's our responsibility as the artist to push as much through that. And now we have the ability to do that because we can put a studio in our house and we can go on Kickstarter and raise money and we can get our friends together and record an album. We don't need the machine mm -hmm. that everybody else needed. But I think um, music becoming more um, technological is just a part of the evolution of technology and art. You see that in all forms of art. You see it in movement, you see it in paintings, you see it in installations. Technology has a way of painting all parts of, of, of art and uh, parts of our society. The issue is when the musicians who don't want to do that aren't offered the same opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we have to rally together and start those underground movements where a lot of great Musicians started anyway back in the day. They started. They were underground. They didn't have like YouTube and Facebook to just blow up overnight. Nobody was really blowing up overnight back in the day. And I also think the live music experience can never be duplicated unless you're there. You know what I mean? So I feel like what will last beyond everything else will be how it began. Just the person and you guys. That's really what it is. For me, it's even like it's like I don't really rely too tough on. I listen to the monitors only because I feel like when everything else is happening and all the other monitors are coming up, it kind of makes the sound weird for me because I come from that classical background where it was just you and the piano and you just stand there and let it happen. There's something magical and something very organic about that, which is why I think that genre classical music has been able to stay alive. But I think that's what will always continue to make itself present. I've seen people go to shows, pop shows now, and they're like, she was terrible live. Like, they're so disappointed. I'm like, well, what did you think was going to happen? Everything she sings is like, like you, that's what the album was. Like, why are you mad? Because they don't sound like that. People still want to feel like they're looking at and communicating and connecting with a human. That's, you know, so I think they won't, we will never be able to get away from that. But I think we as artists, we have to just stick to that. We could do a couple stuff here and there. There's room for it all. But, you know, don't let go of what you know is, is, is real music and, and respect your art form enough to spend time on it to make it right, to sharpen it. Notice no violinists are getting away with that. Mm -hmm. They have to play in no, tune by themselves. They have to play. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask this question. Uh, as you go through your singing career, Sometimes without even making a a uh, obvious attempt to do it, your music takes on a certain cultural significance. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I want to ask you if you have a song in your repertoire that you think already fits this, or will you have an aha moment when that moment comes? Mm -hmm. For instance, it's 1963, mm -hmm. and Sam Cooke sings that change is going to come. Mm -hmm. It may as well be an African American national anthem. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody knows it. So I was coaching a girl, she was 17 years old. She was singing for an NAACP convention. Mm -hmm. And me and another one of her coaches said, if, and it was all going to be older black people. Mm -hmm. And we said, if you sing this song right, there won't be a dry eye and not a twinkle when you finish. Mm -hmm. And she rocked the house. Mm -hmm. So she, 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 at that moment, she absorbed the history of that song. Mm -hmm. It transferred into her. She realized she wasn't just singing a melody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Do you already have a song in your repertoire that, that, that you think it's something of that cultural uh, 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 validity or power or authority? Or will you know that aha moment when you, just, when you got one? I think it really depends on the audience, first of all. I mean, you know, if you're singing for a group of children, they just, their aha is very different, you know? I think I've had several different aha moments singing different pieces. Um, one of the aha moments that I always feel very connected to is when on, well, some of the tunes that we sing have a different impact, but sometimes I actually do an encore. I don't know if I'll do one today because usually it's whatever the audience wants, but I, when we do the encore and when I sing in another uh, configuration program called um, Songs of Freedom, which celebrates songs of Nina Simone, Abby Lincoln, and Joni Mitchell, one of the tunes that I feel really resonates with me of today, and as much as it did when it was written, is Everything Must Change. And, and when I sing that, it's almost a bittersweetness because you realize how much has not changed and how much can change. So there's that, that hope that we can still move forward, but we have to acknowledge where we're failing in progression. So I feel like that becomes like a very aha type of moment. But in the same sense, you know, I feel like I was just talking to, to Miles and the band about this today. Um, I did a piece with Billy Childs and it was about human sex trafficking, like a, just a heavy, heavy topic, but something that, we, you know, you can't ignore. And we performed it at Michigan State. And when, when I was learning the piece and watching all these films, trying to just get into the mindset of, I was like, oh God, this is just so heartbreaking. I wasn't thinking about the aha. I was just trying to really make this authentic for me. But when I performed the piece and I was <coughs> sitting, performing in front of, you know, rows and rows of survivors, as well as, you know, the police department that actually specializes in these rescue uh, missions, then the aha moment was there. And that's because of who was there. You know, I think aha moments can be personal Oh, but they can also be a collective experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the ones you're talking, the one that I feel like you're speaking of in particular is the, the magical aha moments that happen in the collective experience of performance, which is mind blowing. I, I think that's really powerful and it can change both the audience member and the, the artist. Great answer. I know you have a performance. Oh, yeah, and, that. Um, what do you hope that, so well, uh, maybe we'll wrap up. What do you hope that uh, the audience leaves with in their head about you after the concert tonight? Well, to me, it's not so much what they leave about me. Like, I don't feel like it's really about me. I think I want them to leave with a feeling that lasts beyond their, what they thought of what I wore or, or what, whether my feet hurt in those shoes. They will be hurting in those shoes. But I want people to leave with a feeling of feeling connected to the person that sat behind them and that sat next to them. And I want people to remember that, you know, in the big grand scheme of things, the little things don't really matter, but the simple things do. And simple things can be profound as well as considered small. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I want to happen. I, I'd rather somebody hear a song and be like, you know what, maybe things aren't so bad. Well, you know, I really need to, Maybe I just, maybe I should just go home or maybe I should just take that job or maybe I should just, you know, maybe, maybe I should just go ahead and choose that career choice. What am I so afraid of? I'd rather them have that experience than what they thought about me. Cause I'm just the messenger or the prism of the music, right? So the music flows 
through me and then out into the audience in an array of colors that touch people and affect them in whatever way they need to be affected. So it's just past, I'm just the, the prism. That's how I like to think about it. Excellent. Thank you for this. It's lovely listening to you talk, and I'm sure I'm going to like the, the way you sing to it. Did you have a quick question? Oh, sorry. I just had a question about yes. that. Like, yeah, uh, whether you'd made it with the same band that you started out with, or like how you find a, like a you know, talent that will like, match yours. You know? Well, that's a good question, especially yeah. <laughs> he knows about that. Um, well, I, I actually have band members that I play with more than others because they're just there and they're amazing. But sometimes, depending on budget or depending on just curiosity even, with special guests and things like that, you know, I might switch up something or if I'm playing on the West Coast versus the East Coast or if I'm traveling to another country, sometimes I'm invited to do my repertoire but with the band that plays at a particular venue. Um, I will say that my guitarist is somebody that I had a senior recital, my, the guitarist I had did not learn the music, he didn't practice, he came, he showed up, he was terrible, and then he blamed it on everybody. You know, like, this isn't my type of music. I'm like, you just didn't practice. But my recital was like coming up in three days, and you know, recitals are hard. Like you're pulling, I was pulling in classical music and jazz, and I was freaking out. And someone said, I know this great um, guitarist, he's amazing, I think he was like a sophomore. And I was like, whatever, just bring him in here. And he was like, oh, okay, he took the music, he went away. He shed that music and practiced that music. He showed up at the rehearsal, nailed it. And I was like, dude, you're gonna be my American Express. I'm never leaving home without you. Like Aww. anywhere I can go, I will, if I can take you, I will take you. And so David, he's here tonight too with me, but I, I would rather have no guitarist than then play than be forced to play with like a bunch of other guitarists because he can't make it or whatever it yeah i'll be like i just won't yeah. have one i wow. just we'll He's just do MVP. it that's great yeah and you'll hear why okay. you're all coming to the show right yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> thank you very much thank you it was a real pleasure. Aww, thanks. <laughs>